The Agenda in the Summer with Nam Kiwanuka is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism. A once in a generation change to public education was always going to be contentious. I'm Nam Kiwanuka. For this, our final week of the Agenda in the Summer, we're recalling some of Ontario's biggest debates of the past decade and how they inform issues now. Tonight, full day kindergarten. It was a big idea with a big price tag, full day kindergarten for all Ontario children. Here's a look back at the case made at the time by then Minister of Education, Kathleen Wynne. There's a ton of research that we've looked at and that Dr. Pascal looked at when he was writing his report that says that if you can, if you can create a, an, an integrated day, a seamless day for kids where they have consistency of adults throughout the day, uh, if you can get them um, reading, talking, um, listening to language, they're going to do better as they, uh, as they go into school. Is it universal child care through the back door? No, I think it's uh, I think it's a, a different entity. You know, I think it's it's an expanded school program, but it's a play-based curriculum. So we're not we're not talking about taking kids who some of them will be three because when they start school in September, they may be three years old. We're not talking about putting them in a, a strictly academic environment, and that's why having the early childhood educators working with the teachers is, I think, so important. And that's what Dr. Pascal talked about. We need that skill set that the early childhood educators bring combined with the teachers. The teachers, as you said, it's a teacher-led model, but the, the child development and the real understanding of the, the activity-based curriculum that the early childhood educators bring, is a, it's a great complementary skill. Teachers making whatever it is, roughly 80000 a year or something, versus an early childhood educator who might be making forty or $50,000 a year. If you went with more of the latter, fewer of the former, you might come in under a billion dollars. Why did you not choose that? Because this is the best pedagogical model. But we, we might, we, maybe we can't afford the best right well, now. Well, you know what? I think I think that uh, I think we can't afford. I can't. I think we can't afford not to make this investment because this is an economic investment. I mean, we're talking about we're talking about the the money expenditure, but let's talk about the investment. We've got an aging population, and we are going to need every single child at his or her best. And if we can give them a good start, you know, we we need them as fully participating uh, economic units in our in our society. So we can we can look at it in that cold calculating way. And we can also look at it as this is the best pedagogy. How will you measure whether or not this is actually worth the money? Well, we've, you know, we've been pretty intentional about looking at uh, how the gaps between kids who are achieving and kids who aren't, how they're closing and what we're doing to make them close. And so we're going to be tracking, we're going to be tracking the, uh, the early development uh, scores of kids when they come in. And we're going to be looking at overall how are our, how are our kids doing. Okay, that was the argument in 2009 with us for a look at what's happened since in Ontario's capital city. Elizabeth Dewey, economic analysis and policy associate professor at the University of Toronto Scarborough. Early childhood educator Jane Bertrand, who is an adjunct professor at OISE, the Ontario Institute for Studies in Education at U of T. And Kristen Rishawi, Queen's Park reporter at the Toronto Star, who was on the education beat when full day kindergarten was created and rolled out. Welcome to you all. Hello. Hello. Hi there. So um, before we start talking about some of the things that we just saw in that pack that we had, I wanted to go over some of the numbers that we have here. Sheldon, if you can bring up this board for me, please. Uh, the program was rolled out between 2010 and 2014. It cost the province at least $1.5 billion each year, higher than the original proposal due to the model of having both a full-time teacher and a full-time early education worker in the classroom. In the 2019-2020 school year, there were more than 266,000 students enrolled in junior and senior <coughs> kindergarten in Ontario. Um, so we've had a, a chance to look at those numbers. And Kristen, I wanted to start with you. The current kindergarten program that we have right now in Ontario, how similar is it to what was promised back in 2009? 
Well, it's interesting because Charles Pascal, who helped design the full day kindergarten program, had proposed um, a number of options. The one in particular was that there would be two early childhood educators sort of bookending the day and then a half-time teacher. The model that we ended up with was a full-time teacher and a full-time ECE in the school. Um, the idea behind the two ECEs and the half-time teacher was that it could provide the seamless before and after school care. What we've seen on that front is um, some schools offer before and after school care. It depends on numbers. So that is not sort of what was originally promised. That has not come through. But otherwise, um, what we've seen is pretty much what was promised. There's a play-based um, curriculum, which was also extended down into daycare as well. So it does pretty much look like it was supposed to. Um, but um, as was pointed out in the video we just saw, a lot more expensive given the model of a full-time teacher um, as opposed to a half-time kindergarten teacher. And uh, the promise involved um, a, a seamless program. Jane, what does that mean? Well, the original report um, worked on, and I, I worked with, with Charles Pascal as part of the team, was that the early childhood educator in the morning would come in early in the morning and be there until 12 or 1, and the other one would come in around lunch and stay till 6, and the uh, the primary teacher, the school teacher, would be there in the core of the day, so that children would be in the same space with the same faces and the same friends throughout, whether they came earlier for the core school day or stayed for extended hours afterwards. What's transpired uh, was the a model with the early childhood educator and the teacher. And I have to jump in and say, Charles very much supports this model too. It was an evolving um, process as we were going forward. So we were quite um, uh, confident that this was a good model. We had hoped that the before and after, the extended day would be more fully integrated into the school so you could have overlap of staffing. What's transpired is a lot of, in some school boards, Kitchener Waterloo for one, took on the direct delivery of the extended day for the most part and offer it directly so that those early childhood educators can can overlap. Other school boards uh, do third party delivery of the before and after, uh, and some do a mix. Toronto is currently experiencing a mix. What did come into play is that the schools, as is was just noted, uh, the schools must provide some sort of extended day uh, if I think it's eight or ten families request it and that is a requirement it must be uh, provided on uh, and easily available on the school premises and more school boards are stepping up with innovative ways to do it the other big thing that happened as a result of the recommendations going forward is all of the early learning and child care was moved into the ministry of education from the children's services so it's all in the same government provincial place and that has helped to have a better continuum of learning around the pedagogy and curriculum between early learning centers child care centers and the full day kindergarten program and Chris also, I wanted to come back to you sorry um, I just want to come back to Kristen uh, about when we were talking about the daycare I had my kids um, in kindergarten and I know it was extremely it was extremely um, competitive to get them into the before care and the after care. So, Kristen, has that worked out the way it was intended to, or has that uh, shifted as the years have gone by? Well, I think, as Jane just noted, um, not all schools offer it because there's not the demand in every school. And some boards have offered it themselves. Some have turned to third party. So there is a bit of a patchwork system, uh, which maybe was not the original intent. Mm -hmm. um, but that is what, what has transpired. And Elizabeth, the rollout happened over five years. Uh, how did it work? Well, it got rolled out um, basically schools that had space first and then schools that had more need were rolled out first. So basically, you know, they looked at the universe of schools and said, which ones can we easily get a whole nother classroom in, which was a huge problem in terms of the implementation. And then also which um, schools might need this in terms of supporting their students first. Um, so it was definitely not a um, randomized rollout and it was um, politically 
uh, motivated which schools um, got the the Kedurin first. Um, I wanted to get uh, your view, uh, in your opinions, um, from all three of you, how successful the program has been. Uh, Jane, I'd like to start with you. I think overall it has been successful. I could spend the rest of the interview time talking about things that are a work in progress that I'd like to see tweaks to, but I give it an 8.5 at least out of 10, and how it's gone forward, the success of experience for children, the fact that they do have a seamless day, at least for the school day, not the patchwork of two and a half and two and a half. Lots more to do. I think the educator team is was innovative and, and has largely been successful. We can continue to work on collaboration between the two professionals, but I think overall it has strengthened the um, the program that experience that children offer and some of the preliminary uh, evidence we have around outcomes that Jan Pelte and her colleagues have done show that it is making a difference to early learning and children's well-being. And um, Elizabeth Jane gives it a 8.5 out of 10. Um, has in your view has it been successful? <laughs> You know, overall, as a policy, I think, you know, I'm not going to give it a, a number, but I, I feel like it's been a very positive um, thing for our province. Um, you know, I'm going to quibble about, you know, we could have done a lot better so that 10 years out, we would actually have a lot of good measurement. You know, the former premier was talking all about how we'll do all this great measurement and we'll know for sure whether or not this program is successful because of X, Y, and Z. And, and that hasn't played out. And as a researcher, that's a really important aspect to me. Like I've spent a lot of time researching full day kindergarten and the rollout. And I would like to know a lot more. Um, you know, as a parent, I'll give it 8.5. My kid is going to JK next year and I feel pretty comfortable and I'm happy with the program. And that's with me knowing a lot about early education and, um, and what kids need. So, I, you know, I'll give it an 8.5 to you. I'll just go with the number. <laughs> what about you, Kristen? No pressure. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I think in general, definitely parents like the program, right? I mean, kids can be in school as early as age three for junior kindergarten. Um, they're getting the same kind of play-based, inquiry-based curriculum that they're getting if they're in um, organized daycare as well. So there is that continuity there. Um, the only quibbles that I've heard, um, again, the collaboration between the teachers and the ECEs, sometimes that's a bit rocky. Um, as mentioned before in the video, there is a difference in pay. Um, you know, sometimes maybe the teacher seen as the authority in the classroom as opposed to it being a true partnership. The other issue that does crop up is the class size. Um, you know, the kids can be in classes of about 30, right? It's two adults, but that's still a lot of little bodies in one classroom. And that is the one thing we definitely hear from educators that is their biggest concern. And that's even pre-COVID. And Elizabeth, just to come back to what you were saying, uh, when we talk about measuring outcomes, how do you measure outcomes? Well, you know, we had a perfect situation here in Ontario where we needed to roll this gigantic program out within a very short time period. And so if it had been done correctly, we would have randomized which schools got kindergarten at each year. So it was very quick rollout. This wouldn't have really impacted very many people in terms of, you know, delaying their their um, getting of the program. And then we would actually be able to measure their outcomes by using this randomization, looking at test scores, looking at the EDI score. Um, I also would have liked to see a lot more other kinds of measurement saying, um, you know, test scores aren't measured until later, but we, we have a lot of ways that we can measure how kids are doing early on. And we didn't really do that as a province. There wasn't a huge push for that. And I think that was a really lost opportunity. And Jane, you know, um, in the pack that we, we showed, uh, Steve Pakin referred it, you know, some people might think that um, full day kindergarten is, quote, universal child care through the back door. Um, you know, how do we test kids increasing uh, kids um, the soft social skills. How do we do that? Well, there are there are measures to do that, and I would like to just again point out Jan Pelte's research, which wasn't a big random control uh, study, as as Elizabeth has pointed to. That didn't happen, but she happened to already be tracking kids in Peel in part day and was able to have a group of schools that were. Uh, part day 
for the period, you know, for three years, part day, and then went to full day and full day the whole time. So it was uh, fortuitous. And it, so that made for a strong study that has been published and shown positive results. Uh, social emotion, uh, on social uh, emotional and on uh, literacy, numeracy, and some of those other skill areas. Uh, the early development instrument that Elizabeth mentioned does capture, it's not meant to be an individual monitoring tool. It's meant to look at groups of kids, population-based, developed about 20 years ago, the Offord Centre used across Canada, including in Ontario. So that is one tool, but it it is a... Um, it's useful at a population level to show you trends. It's less useful uh, to really dig down and understand what a specific program uh, approach has been. Uh, I think we can, uh, the soft skills, the social skills are the ones that in numerous, numerous rigorous research studies show are the important ones that don't fade out and seem to really underpin later success in uh, in academic achievement and in life in general. Um, and lots of uh, uh, multiple lines um, of studies have, have shown us this. I think if the other measure to look at or the other kind of factor to take into account is the rate that children are referred for special education appraisal and, and needs and so forth and so on. About 60% of those right now are for mild learning problems related to math or literacy or language delays or behavior problems. Uh, and those are the very things, the very items that uh, research shows us or quality early childhood education can reduce, can ameliorate. So I think looking at that, are we seeing any differences in, in special education uh, 10 years later and the draw on it when kids enter grade one and grade two? Kristen, I saw, I saw you nodding or you wanted to say something? Yes. Yeah, I just wanted to say, certainly, as Jane pointed out, it does allow for early detection of learning issues or anything like that. Um, on the point of research, the Trump Catholic Board, prior to the province introducing full-day kindergarten, offered its own full-day kindergarten. It targeted it at high-needs neighborhoods, and they were able to eliminate um, all literacy issues within three years. And, you know, the kids were reading at a grade two level well before they were in grade two. So, and that was with a full-time teacher. So there is some research showing the gains, the early gains that kids make. The question is whether they peter off over time. Um, with the program only having been in place fully since 2014, I think we probably need a few more years of data to, to figure that out. But um, for the Toronto Catholic Board in particular, um, it actually put the literacy teacher out of out of a job because it was so successful. <laughs> Which is, um, I mean, not, not the part of them being out of a job, but it's great news when children are reading um, early. Um, Elizabeth, your research focused on the impact it would have on women in the labor force. What was the promise? Yeah, so a lot of these um, kind of policies have sort of the double benefit, one on kids, so really good high quality education, but then we have to remember about the parents. And we generally as a society, you know, as an economist speaking, we want people to be at work and being gainfully employed and having sort of an easy way, if they choose to enter the labor force, to have their kids self, like safely taken care of. And so the, one of the goals was also to increase women's labor supply, so get more women working working or if they're working working more hours. And so my research team was sort of focused on looking at the French system, which did this in the 1990s, and then also current, like the more recent rollout, and showed that actually it did. It did increase women's labor supply. So more women, once they had, you know, imagine this, you have a few more extra hours a day that your kid is well taken care of, you feel much more comfortable going back to work, and you're going to be working more hours. So there was some benefits for um, women in specific. You know, you can say that that would probably affect the family in general, where, you know, the higher income coming into a family level would also be good. Um, you know, I'm, the pandemic has uh, thrown a wrench in a lot of uh, things in daily life. And I, I'm sure with um, uh, kindergarten, maybe this is a conversation that we're going to be having two years from now. But when um, uh, Premier Ford came into power, he and Education Minister Stephen Lecce talked about potentially changing full-day kindergarten to something called full-day learning. Jane, what's the difference? I was never entirely clear what the difference was, um, it seemed that they wanted to pull it out of the 
K to 12 system and perhaps put it in to uh, regulate it childcare. Community-based centers might be located in schools, but I was never entirely clear what they had in mind. I also think that they were looking at reducing um, uh, the, or removing, as I recall, sorry, I'm a little foggy on the details here, uh, but removing uh, the primary teachers and just having early childhood educators. Um, and they changed direction. And don't worry about it, Jane. I think we all have pandemic <laughs> fog. Um, Kristen, um, why do you think uh, the government backtracked? They were looking at, um, I think, different staffing models and maybe to save a bit of money. Part of the questions they were asking people were, how would you feel about um, the day being run by an early childhood educator as opposed to a teacher. So I think maybe that's where the learning versus kindergarten came in. Maybe it wouldn't be kindergarten if it wasn't a fully certified teacher teaching it. I mean, it's not the first time people have looked at the program. I mean, certainly Don Drummond, uh, about a decade ago for the Liberal mm -hmm. government, uh, when they were looking to trim their deficit, he said, look, it's $1.5 billion. It's an easy place to trim. Um, you know, it wasn't fully implemented at that time. So he suggested getting rid of it, um, which was also a no-go. And um, I think Tim Hudak in uh, 2014 mm -hmm. was also suggesting that it may be a teacher only. So it's not the first time it's come under fire. I think mostly it's a cost-saving measure when governments do look at it because um, it is very popular among parents and it's not something that I see them changing anytime soon. And Elizabeth, as I mentioned, um, the pandemic has changed things. Uh, we've been hearing reports of women leaving their jobs to stay home and take care of their children. Uh, the government's going to be responsible for a lot of costs. This program costs more than $1.5 billion a year. Given the deficit and the cost of the pandemic, um, I'm sure the government is going to be trying to figure out how to where to cut costs for uh, the recovery. How can the government determine if the current model is, as Kathleen Wynne described, truly the best for kids? You know, that's a hard question now. I mean, we can put a little bit of money into doing some good research on this and getting a little bit more evidence. Um, you know, a lot of programs that people look at and research find little to no effect. And this is a program that I'm fairly comfortable saying, this is a win, this is good for children. You know, I can quibble again about like how well we know this, but we, we see positive effects on kids, we see positive effects on um, parents. And so this would seem to me um, like a very terrible idea to be going after this particular program. Um, you know, can, can we put some more money and look at, you know, how it's benefiting? Can we tweak it? Can we make some changes? You know, sure. But in terms of like how to move forward um, out of a pandemic, you know, taking away a secure, safe environment for kids that parents are really happy with. I'm super secure with my kid going to JK. All the parents I know other than COVID, let's ignore COVID part. Like that would be a really bad choice in terms of making women getting confident to go back to the workforce and increasing economic productivity. So this would not be the place that I would be looking to cut um, going forward. I think this would be one of the worst places to go um, moving forward because we know how important women in the workforce are. We know how important education is for young children. So, um, you know, there's many things that we can do moving forward to sort of increase economic prosperity. Um, this would be a very bad choice in terms for bang for the buck. You know, you can save a little bit of money, but we're going to have a lot of problems if you do that. Um, we have less than five minutes left, and I want to get in a few more questions in. Um, if the program has been so successful for kids, should it be mandatory? Jane? No. I, I, I think uh, we have high take-up rate without it being mandatory. Um, it's well over where it was before. It actually went up when we moved. The enrollment went up when we moved from half day to full day, partly because it became a more viable option for families rather than trying to deal with the part day or every other day thing. But I think keeping it uh, optional for parents, for parents to make that decision, is the best case going forward. It's proven itself. It's got a high rate of take up. Um, and I don't think we need, I, I don't think there's much to gain by pushing against those families who choose to keep their kids at home for another year or two. Uh, and we'd be best to keep it um, non mandatory. And it's popular enough. We don't need to do that to get kids to attend. And Kristen and Elizabeth, should it be mandatory? Kristen? 
Um, you know, I think as Jane said, I think it's up to parents to decide. I mean, right, <clears throat> excuse me, right now kids don't have to be in school until they're age six. Um, some mm -hmm. parents choose to keep their kids at home. Some parents put their kids in a Montessori or alternate program. Uh, sometimes for other childcare or work reasons, it doesn't work for parents. So no, I don't think it needs to be, to be mandatory uh, at any time. And Elizabeth? Yeah, I, I don't see any reason why it needs to be mandatory. We have incredibly high take up rate. Mm -hmm. If you look at, um, you know, what you would worry about is if there are certain segments of the population mm -hmm. that are not uptaking this program and that potentially we would say, well, you know, they would be in a better situation if they were in full day kindergarten versus what they're doing elsewhere. And um, I don't see any evidence looking at the data mm -hmm. when you look at who arrives in first grade. Um, it looks like a nice wide variety of individuals are deciding to do something different for their family. So there's no evidence that um, there's any kind of problem with the very small percentage of, of parents that are keeping their kids home. So uh, no need to change. Um, as we all know, the, uh, fed, the we have a federal election coming up on September 20th, and the Liberals have proposed a $10 a day universal child care program. Um, what lessons should they learn from the Ontario full day kindergarten experience? Jane? Well, I think they probably learned that providing expanded early learning and childcare opportunities is very, very popular amongst families. And I think, frankly, back to your earlier questions, why did the Ford government back away from some of the changes it was talking about? I think it was pushed back from families. And I'm not talking about just downtown Toronto families. I'm talking about families uh, across, the, across the province. So I think that was one of the things that they learned. And I also think that they're calling it early learning and child care and, insist, and um, putting out that the quality criteria is, is part of what they're looking for in their agreements with the provinces points to it's not just about minding the kids so moms can work. Mm -hmm. uh, as important as that might be, um, it is when kids are six and they're in grade one uh, as well. But it's also about providing early learning experiences for young children. And uh, Elizabeth, you have 30 seconds. Um, I think they've learned that um, this kind of program is a good um, investment. Parents like it. The economy likes it. Um, coming out of COVID, where they were worried about learning loss and kids catching back up, you know, they hopefully will learn that this kind of programming is going to be, you know, one of the good economic um, stimulus that they can provide moving forward. Um, a big thank you to the three of you. Uh, we'll be watching what's going to be happening in the next little bit with education, with schools coming back. So we really do appreciate your insight on this look back. Thank you. And let's look forward. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. And that's it for tonight's agenda in the summer. Tomorrow, we continue our look back at big Ontario debates to consider the fate of Ontario Place. I'm Nam Kiwanuka. Thanks for watching TVO and for joining us online at TVO.org. The Agenda in the Summer with Nam Kiwanuka is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism. The Agenda is always on. To catch up on conversations from this week or any week, visit our website, tvo.org slash the agenda, or our YouTube page at youtube.com slash the agenda. It's all there for whenever you want to watch.